the leadership of OASIS and I'm going to be hosting us this morning and leading us through. We're really glad that you've joined us. Um, I hope that this morning will be stimulating. I hope it will also be a chance, a space for you to reflect on your own experience and the road ahead. As we face some of the daunting issues of unemployment, economic downturn, educational impact on a generation of children and young people that COVID has um, not created, but perhaps exacerbated. We think the church has a huge opportunity to be a part of the answer. So that's what we're talking about this morning, how our churches can respond to the social, spiritual, economic and practical needs of individuals and whole communities, the challenges that people will face in a post-COVID Britain and how we can reimagine stronger Christ-centered and more inclusive church communities. Um, as we're not able to be together face to face this morning, then um, there are a couple of ways for you to take part through this webinar. So um, the chat function is disabled and you're muted, but you can still talk to us using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you also will have seen that we have a poll running. So if you haven't had a chance to answer that, um, you can do that with the poll button. That's just to give you a chance to say who you are and where you're coming from this morning so that hopefully we can make sure that what we're talking about um, is relevant and hits the spot. So do use the Q&A to um, drop in questions that you're interested in. Maybe there's one question that you've come with, the reason that you've come along to this today. If you drop that into the Q&A chat, we'll try and respond. Um, as we go along. We're going to have two Q&A sessions, um, one with Steve after he's spoken, and then after a short break, mid-morning, we're going to have a panel of church and community workers from around Oasis. So loads of opportunity there to ask practical questions of them um, and to join that discussion. So we're going to begin um, by hearing from Steve on the theology of community building. Um, we will be talking about lots of practical things and getting into some of the specific questions that COVID raises for us as a church across the country. Um, but we are beginning by talking about theology because we think that everything that we do, all of our behaviours and our practice as church communities flows from the things that we believe. So um, it's my job just to hand over to Steve. He may not need too much introduction, um, but Steve is the founder of Oasis, which began about 35 years ago. So he's speaking to us this morning from his experience of beginning and growing Oasis over the last 35 years and its mission to transform local communities, and also from his experience as a church leader um, in the middle of Oasis. So Steve, welcome. And over Thanks, Danielle. Great. Thanks, Danielle. And thank you very much, Danielle. And good morning uh, to you all. And I think uh, Danielle set up what we want to do uh, really perfectly there. We're going to begin, as Danielle's already said, with theology. And then slowly, that theology will become more and more practical. That's one way of putting it. It's not really the way I put it, but I'll explain that as we go along. But slowly you'll find that we become more and more practical. So it may just be that you've come on this, uh, this webinar this morning because you want to know what you can do about education, what you can do about unemployment, what you can do about uh, mental health, uh, young people's mental health, mental health of older people, what you can do about housing, how you can work with your local authority, how you can work with other uh, uh, um, partners in your community without losing uh, your your direction and your vision. Uh, I, I, growing up, I was always told that if you work with local authorities or government, it was a bit like getting in bed with the devil. You'd end up compromised and you'd lose your way. Um, so we're going to deal with all of those uh, questions and how do you get involved and how do you make a difference? How do you begin a conversation? How do you put together a strategic plan? We get to all of those things, but we need to, as Danielle said, start with theology. We need to start with theology because actually that is the vital key. I hope that will make sense to you as we go along. So perhaps the most shocking part of this morning uh, will be the first session that I do, and then slightly less shocking, the second, 
uh, session, and then there'll be a chance, as Daniel says, for questions. And then we then we really motor on with this fantastic team who are on the call from Oasis uh, with us, from their experience of actually delivering stuff on the ground. And then I'll come back towards the end and put some uh, principles, uh, unifying principles, if you like, around all of that. Now, what I'm going to do is the most tricky bit of the whole mo morning. It's to attempt to share my screen with you. So um, if I achieve that, um, I, there you go. I think I, I think we might get there. Uh, uh, boy, it says that. Oh, yeah, found it. There's so many things I, I can share with you here. I've got a huge list and I'll end up sharing the wrong one. So there it is. OK. Boom. Right. Great. So can someone turn on their mic, Danielle or someone else and shout, we can see that. Great. Fantastic. So uh, what we're doing, as Danielle's already said, with this, uh, this webinar is called Reimagine the Church and the Post-COVID World. And we've already begun to talk about some of those opportunities. The first slide I want to show you, I don't know if you can still see me in all of this or not, but the first slide, a slide I want to show you is this, the tree. And I'd like you to take just a moment to reflect. Um, you may be watching this with someone else in a bubble. Uh, you may be on your own. But what, uh, beside its bad pixelation, do you see about that tree? What's your reflection on that tree? Just for a moment. I'm sure as you begin to look at that, even superficially, and there's actually lots to it, the more you reflect upon it, you'll see that the rooting system of the tree is bigger than the foliage. The rooting system, however, is unseen. It's kind of ugly. And uh, when you walk through a park on a, a wonderful spring afternoon uh, uh, day like this one, uh, you see the foliage, or perhaps not yet, but you'll see the buds and, uh, and, and flowers beginning to burst up. But we never look at the roots. In fact, we don't really imagine that a tree has roots. I mean, I know we know, but we, we misappropriate the shape of a tree altogether. There's more of a tree that's under the ground than over the ground. But it's not just that. It's that what we see over the ground, as beautiful as, as it is, is completely dependent on what's under the ground in order for its survival. The rooting system, because it's vast, protects the, uh, the tree in a storm. It stops it blowing right over. It stops it being wiped out. But the rooting system also provides it with all its nourishment. The roots are everything. Without the roots, the tree is dead. That's why we need to look at theology first, because in actual fact, it's our understanding of the world and what God is doing and our role in it that make the difference when delivering into our local communities and beyond. We'll return to this picture and that theme as we go. I'd like to ask you about this man. I guess you all know who he is, Martin Luther King. So Martin Luther King wrote several books, one from, uh, uh, one from prison. He uh, made extraordinary speeches. He was a fantastic leader and um, a Baptist minister as well. Uh, but Martin Luther King, everything about him can be uh, summed up in one phrase, perhaps. I'd like you to take a guess at what you would say, if you had to give Martin Luther King's message in one short phrase, a few words, what would it be? Martin Luther King's story can be summed up, can't it, in that little phrase, I have a dream. I have a dream. Here's someone else. You might not recognize her, so I'll tell you who she is. Uh, this is Emmeline Pankhurst. Emmeline Pankhurst. So, Emmeline Pankhurst, was a protester, uh, a, 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 a political antagonist. Uh, she gave her life for the cause she most believed in. But what short phrase could you sum Emmeline Pankhurst's work up in? 
And the answer is, as I guess most of you have, have guessed already, vote for women. So Martin Luther King, with this huge array of scholarship and social action, all summed up in I Have a Dream. Emmeline Pankhurst, all summed up in votes for women, about, uh, for women's emancipation. The question for us, the question for us is how do we sum up what it is we're bringing? In a nutshell, in a phrase, I have a dream, votes for women. What is our message? That's our core theology. And that is what I'd like to talk about. Now, I'm going to show you now a film, which I hope you can hear as well. And uh, this, uh, this film uh, is one that um, well, as you'll see, I made uh, the beginnings of in, nine, in uh, 2004 and the, the, the later bits of, I think, in 2007. So I look pretty horrendous in it and um, uh, I wish I could have made it lots of other ways. But it's worth watching, I think, because I'd like to draw some principles out of it. round here and goes way on over there so uh, that's the far perimeter I think the school that we plan here we want this to be the, uh, the hub of learning not just for the for the pupils but for their mums and their dads and their grandfathers and their grandmothers for the whole community we think that that bank will be really quite useful seven years ago I came and stood in a field here and I dreamt about a school being built here I remember dreaming about a restaurant that we might have, growing crops, youth clubs and children's clubs and the interconnectedness of that with the school. All of that has come about. Here is the academy, we've got a wonderful restaurant, we run youth clubs, we have a children's centre, a nursery as part of that, we have a community church, gardening clubs, lots of activities because actually we grow together. One of the problems in our society is people feel unknown. We're connected to endless people by phone and email and Facebook, but in reality, we're probably truly known by fewer people. And so, the idea that became Oasis was the idea of building communities where people's needs at every level were being met in an interconnected way. We want to create a new sense of village, a new sense of belonging, and that's what a hub is. But I sense that we're just at the beginning. There's scope to bring more depth to them now, both as we grow other hubs and as we give away the model to other people so they can copy it and go further. Oasis is about the transformation and the making of healthy communities. So there it is. Um, that film made uh, a, a decade ago, or more than a decade ago now, and that dream. So I think uh, it said at the end of the film, there were 12 Oasis hubs. I think there are 42 in this country now, and there are others that Oasis runs around the world, all Christ-centered communities driven by our core belief, which we'd sum up in just a phrase, God is love so everyone is in. Here's uh, a famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door, but it says this, let me in. Why, says the person, so I can save you. Save you from what? Save you from what I'm going to do to you if you don't let me in. There's a message at the core of some people's gospels, which is bad news, not good news. We come to a community to convert people. We come to a community to tell them that an angry God is against them. 
that they stand one chance it's to pray a prayer and if they pray that prayer then salvation will be theirs now if we hold to that core belief that root it permeates through everything that we do and everything that we say in the end the problem is that our core beliefs leak out through our body language. They leak out through everything that we say and we do. And it means that as we begin to work in a community, we often end up with being unclear ourselves about what we're trying to do. Here is a, a picture of the Sistine Chapel, the wall of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Uh, this was painted by Michelangelo. He also painted the ceiling. You can see bits of the ceiling, uh, just bits of the ceiling above him. Uh, the finger of God, you can't see it, but that's where it is. And he painted the ceiling in his early years when he had a light spirit. He painted this end of the Sistine Chapel, which is called uh, the Judgment of God, um, at, uh, towards the end of his life, right at the end of his life. And if you look up at the ceiling, which we can't see, it's filled with light and God reaching out to Adam and touching humanity. But if you look at the end, the end wall painted many, many years later, um, you see something different. Here's just one corner of that painting. People being dragged down into hell. Look at them writhing in agony as they are ripped down into hell and demons chasing them there. Here's a hymn from Isaac Watt, famous hymn writer. We sing, of course, many Isaac Watts hymns still. But here's one verse from one of the hymns we still sing, actually. But here's uh, one verse that we never sing anymore. More. What bliss will fill the ransomed souls, that's us, of course, when they in glory dwell, to see the sinner as he rolls in quenchless flames of hell. Here's a fantastic sign that I uh, saw. Jesus cares, but of course, that was a design error. It actually also says Jesus scares. And that is the problem. Jesus scares. Often as we approach a local authority or central government or um, a local business or a national business, as we approach another charity, as we approach others to work with them, they're very worried. Here in Waterloo, where I'm speaking from this morning, one of the projects that we run, which is a partnership with the local authority, is the local library. When we took on the local library, um, it, 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 the, the local authority had been running it. They couldn't afford to do it on their own. They wanted to do it in partnership. Uh, so there we are working together. But when we took it on, there was quite a lot of opposition at the time in the community uh, from sections of the community from people who said, if you allow these Christians to run this library, they ban all the books that they don't like and they stock lots of Bible. They won't stop the Quran. They won't stop books by secularists. They won't stop books um, about the LG uh, that are favorable to the LGBT community. They won't stop books about other religions. They won't stop the Karma Sutra. It won't be a library, it will be censored. When we took on a school uh, uh, some years ago, perhaps 10 years ago in the city of Bristol, uh, the, the uh, local paper, the Evening News, published a report. Uh, it's on, I wish I'd have kept it. It was front page story with a giant headline. And the headline and the subheadline in the story was all about if Oasis got to take on this failing secondary school as it was, we, our our, bla our uh, uniforms for our secondary schools always consist of a, have a blazer uh, as part of them. And the story said, published by a journalist called Linda, who I later became a friend of mine, uh, Linda published this story. We didn't know each other then. And she said, this bunch of evangelicals are, are coming to take over this school and brainwash our kids. And the only reason they have a blazer is so they can pop their free Bibles in the pockets and have them ready to use in any lesson. That's why being clear about what we're doing and saying and not doing and saying and being clear about what our goals are, are really important. When Oasis comes to bring a library, it comes to bring a library. 
If we come to bring a food bank, we bring a food bank. If we're about debt advice, we're about debt advice, not about conversions and numbers of people who sit on seats in church buildings. It's about transparency and clarity. So leading deeper into some theology from there, here's a very famous uh, New Testament verse. It's quoted all the time. Uh, uh, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I grew up on this verse. I've listened to more sermons on this verse than I can shake a stick at or remember. It's a very confusing statement, actually, although we don't stop to look at it. For it is by grace you've been saved. Ah, we're saved by grace. Now, what's grace? Well, we've all been taught that grace is undeserved love. Nothing to do with what I do, everything to do with who God is. Grace, embrace. In spite of myself and who I am and what I've done and what I've said and my mixed motives and my brokenness, I am embraced unconditionally by the love of God. Nothing to do with me. But then it says this, for it's by unconditional, undeserved grace that you've been saved through faith. Through faith. Yeah. And that's where pray this prayer comes in. You're a sinner. You're under God's judgment. But if you pray this prayer, if you place your faith in Jesus, if you place your faith in Jesus and become part of the church and renounce your sins and turn to him, you are saved. Don't turn away. But then we've got a problem because actually the first clause says we're saved by grace. And the second clause is saying that we're saved by our faith and our prayer and our commitment. And that's why we are so keen to get out there. Um, Oasis took over, uh, took over, a crude term, horrible term actually, but became responsible for another school. And as I walked across the fields of that school, big secondary school on its opening day, um, one of the local church leaders, actually a Baptist minister, I strolled across the uh, grass with me and he said, I'm so pleased that you're taking this on, Steve. And I said, oh, thanks. That's really kind of you. He said, yeah, we'd be able to do assemblies again. And I said, what do you mean able to do assemblies again? Of course, you mean again. He said, oh, we got banned. I said, you didn't, did you? He said, yeah, that's why we're so pleased that you're taking it on. I said, well, what were you banned for? And he then proceeded to tell me it at a little bit length. He said, we got banned because we believe the most important per, uh, question a young person faces is their eternal destiny. And we got banned because we came into assemblies and told young people the truth, the truth that they were going to hell because of their sins, because they were born into sin without praying a prayer. We were banned, so we're really pleased that you're back and then we can resume. And I said, well, I've got some really bad news for you. We won't be a lift in a ban on that. Of course, there'd be a ban on that. That's proselytization. It's not education. You can, of course, come in and say what your beliefs are without scaring kids. But we'll also be asking in the imam to talk about what his beliefs are instead of relying on a bunch of Christians to talk about what Islam is. Because we believe that every child in our care it needs to grow up with an understanding of the various worldviews that there are. So you're really welcome. You're really welcome on those terms. And we'd love you to come and take a football club. And we'd love you to use some of this grass. There was a lot of grass at that school. There is a lot of grass at that school. You could turn some of this into a farm or an allotment and work with the kids. So you can start an art class after school. You can do all of these things, but you cannot proselytize. But you see, his understanding came out of a particular understanding of this verse. For it's by grace you've been saved. But no, it's not. It's through faith. But then this gets even more complicated because it says, and this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God, which is why John Calvin, I hate getting into uh, uh, being that kind of, oh, no, you're thinking. I thought this was about practical community work and we're already into John Calvin. But you'll all know that John Calvin, that great reformer, came up with what was called in the end uh, uh, du double predestination. Some people predestined to heaven, the elect, and some people predestined to hell because 
faith is a gift not from ourselves but it's a gift from god and so if someone has faith if you've got faith it was given to you by god lucky eh but if you your cousin your mum your dad your partner your somebody that you love hasn't got faith and they won't pray a prayer and they can't believe in god well this verse makes it clear <laughs> your faith only came to you as a gift from god so tough luck on them it's not by works not by what you do so no one can boast it's a confusing verse when you look at it it's a very confusing verse and it's caused a lot of problems so now we're going to get really boring because this word is a greek word you'll recognize the pi at the beginning because if it, it maths at school but this says pistis um and pistis is the greek word that means faith we are told and of course so much of what we believe when we come to be involved in communities is around what we believe about faith and people having faith so it's important to look at what the bible actually says about this now here comes a stick of dynamite into our conversation because i'm going to quote a scholar a guy called ed sanders who's in his 90s now he was an oxford professor and i'm going to quote him and he's going to say something to you which is like bomb going off in uh, in people's faith but just before i tell you about this man ed sanders you think oh steve's going to quote some obscure theologian who doesn't really know what he's talking about as uh, ed sanders taught at oxford university in his class that's someone who you may have heard of he's called tom wright nt wright the great uh, great scholar and book writer tom sat in his class along with others that perhaps you wouldn't know the names of but have become very influential writers and everything that tom wright has written since he would say is just is it's just a reflection it well he actually what the the illustration tom uses he says he says that he says that ed sanders dropped a kind of huge pebble into the pond and everything else is a ripple so tom would describe himself as a ripple because ed sanders said in the bible the word pistis never meant faith it meant faith and you think oh no steve we came to learn about working with local councils and running libraries and schools and coffee mornings and etc etc and opening up to the community not about pistis but pistis which was always reckoned well for a long time in the western part of the church to mean faith actually said ed sanders never did it always meant faithfulness and the new testament even though it's written in greek this is a greek word is reflecting hebrew thought paul was a hebrew thinker who just used greek to write down hebrew thoughts jesus uh, didn't speak in greek so we've translated his thoughts into greek jesus was a hebrew thinker all of the uh, writers of the new testament are hebrew thinkers and what every hebrew could only ever mean by the word pistis is faithfulness not faith and here's a little example of that because as ed sanders said we use it um we we swap and change the meaning as we choose here is a i whip this off the internet um and this is a transliteration of uh, uh galatians chapter 5 verse 22 it's the fruit of the spirit and you see there's a greek text and there's the english text alongside it but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness and if you look along can you see that in that column the english column there if you look along in the greek column you'll see the word that is translated as faithfulness not faith is pistis pistis said ed sanders means faithfulness and because it means faithfulness and we translated it as faith we've really screwed up so let's come back to that verse for it's by grace you've been saved through faith and it's not from yourself it's a gift from god not by works, so that no one can boast how confusing was that verse just now but now let's reread it this way for it's by grace undeserved love that you've been saved through faithfulness which is not from yourselves it's the gift of god it's god's faithfulness god's love god's grace god is love you're in you're special 
It's nothing to do with your works. It's not by works. No one can boast, not even the Baptists, not even the evangelical C of E's, not even the Methodists, none of the Christians. No one can boast. Oh, I've prayed the prayer, not you, because it's all about grace through God's faithfulness, through faithfulness. And this is not from yourselves. It's not your faithfulness to keep it a set of rules, to rocking up at church on a Sunday morning, to praying in prayers, to reading the Bible every morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's nothing to do with that. It's a gift of God's faithfulness to you. And then uh, Ed Sanders and others went on to say this. Here's an, it gets even more complicated. He says, Pistis Christus which was translated by Martin Luther, the great reformer, and John Calvin as faith in Christ. You are saved by your faith in Christ. And it occurs in all these places in the New Testament. It's a famous book. It's a famous phrase of Paul's, actually. And many books have been written about it. And here is an old version uh, this was uh, from the 70s of Philippians chapter three, which is one of those verses. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which is through faith in Christ. We're saved by our faith in Christ. As you were taught as a kid, as I was taught as a kid, we're saved by our faith in Christ. Now, that's Philippians chapter three, verse nine in the 70s. But then Ed came up, Ed Sanders came along and he, he said, he wrote in the um, early 70s as well. He said, no, it doesn't mean faith in Christ. It means the faithfulness of Christ. It's taken a long time, but here's the latest edition of the New International Version. That was the New International Version, you see, NIV. And you think the NIV, if you bought it in the 80s or you bought it last year, says the same thing. It doesn't because it's been constantly updated in line with the best scholarship and best understanding. And here is the latest version. Uh, um, and it, this is what it says. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, it still says what the 1970s version says, the 73 version says. But can you see that little A? Check it out in your Bible, it'll be there. That little A, then read down and look at the bottom of the footnote. It says, or through the faithfulness of Christ. So we've made a journey. The scholars call this the new perspective on Paul. I think that's a misnomer. This is a new perspective on the gospel. This is a new perspective on our message. This is a new perspective on life. We are rescued through the faithfulness of Christ, the faithfulness of God in Christ. God is love. And that's our message. Not you're a, you're a lousy sinner. Pray this prayer and then you'll be in. It's a revolution. Uh, here's some verses from uh, Peter. Um, uh, uh, one Peter. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body and made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, rising from the dead, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Now, here's a picture from the eastern half of the church. Because, well, I'll explain that in a moment. Here's a picture from the eastern half of the church. There are thousands of these. You can find them in any Orthodox church. You can find them in Orthodox churches in your city, the nearest Orthodox church to you, any Eastern church. Um, and, and what is this a picture of? It's a picture of what we just read from uh, 1 Peter. There's Christ in the middle. He's risen from the dead. Look what he's standing on. He's standing on some broken doors. He's broken down the gates of hell as uh, Jesus said uh, in Matthew's gospel. And who are these people that he's, he's pulling up out of their tombs? They're Adam and Eve, and they represent the whole of humanity. And everybody stood around watching the angels, all of humanity watches. And down at the bottom, there are uh, the demons, the, their gates of hell are broken. Hell is being broken into. Jesus rescues all of humanity there and then. Hell is emptied. It's called the harrowing of hell. Here's another. These are uh, these are old um, uh, um, uh, icons on the walls of, 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 of churches. This one's actually on the wall of a church that I've been to in Cyprus. And there it is again. Jesus, risen from the dead, trampling down Satan, imprisoning Satan, rescuing. That's Adam and Eve again. Everybody watching. Hell has been shut. 
So says Paul in his gospel, uh, and Paul wasn't a Westerner, of course, uh, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them anymore, unlike the church half the time. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. You're in. God loves you. Not a negative message. So writes Paul in his most theological letter. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation can ever, will be ever able to separate us, us, all of us, not just us, a little few who sit there, humanity from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, the Lord. Writing again in Colossians, he says, for God was pleased to have all his full fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his, his blood shed on the cross, closing hell through what is in. I put to you that our message, and this is Oasis' message, is you're in, you're in, God loves you. Let's live like it now. And I believe that that's what the New Testament teaches. In actual fact, it's what the whole of the Eastern Church has always taught. And it's what the Western church taught until the Reformation. So this isn't a new message. That's the other problem with Ed Sanders and Tom Wright and others calling it the new perspective. It's the old perspective, really. Um, and we've got to get back to it. You can find out more about this in a book that I've written, which is called The Lost Message of Jesus. Now, I've put up there questions, but what we're actually going to do is just take um, uh, a one minute break so you can reflect on that and think about questions you'd like to ask me about that as Danielle uh, creates that opportunity in a bit. So I know I've said loads, I know it's the theology, but I hope you can see that the way we approach the people that we've come to work with, what's in our heart about them makes all the difference to our integrity in what we're doing. Why don't you write down your questions just for a moment, then we go into session two.